All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker of today. It's Nicola De Franceschi, who is a postdoc in my lab. Just for introduction briefly, sort of like it's more than 10 years ago that we started to think about synthetic cells and all that. I delved sort of like uh, when the thought first appears, it seems like over ambitious, like biology is so complex. Can you ever do that? But then this then the thought stuck and we started to get concrete and build up structures and in my lab and other labs at Delft, we started to make vesicles on chip and filling them with proteins, FTSE and what have you not. Because we in our lab, we focus particularly on cell division uh, generated by proteins that deform uh, membranes. And a number of people are working on that project in my lab. And Nicola has joined me some three years ago or so. Um, Nicola uh, is Italian, but did his PhD in Finland, I believe, on, in biochemistry, and did a postdoc with Patricia Bassero in Paris, and joined my lab three years ago, and he developed uh, a number of interesting projects in my lab, and I won't give away too much of the contents, but just give him the floor to present his latest work on synthetic cell division. Nicola. Yeah. Oh, and maybe a last point of order. If you have any questions, please put them already in the chat. And then we go through the chat questions first after the talk. And after, of course, you can speak up then. And we have a long discussion. Nicola, go ahead. OK, thank you, Case, for the kind introduction. I also thank the organizer for giving me the possibility to present my work in front of this audience and all of you for joining. Uh, so this seminar is going to be about biological membranes and in particular membrane shape and it's divided in three parts. In the first part, I'm going to introduce some basic concept about membrane shapes and why membrane shape is so important. Then in the second part, I will introduce a new method that we have developed to generate complex membrane shapes in vitro, which we call synthetic membrane shape. And finally, I will show some preliminary data on how we're using this new method uh, to reconstitute synthetic cell division uh, from the bottom up. So let's start with a simple question. What is a membrane? A membrane is just a thin layer of liquid, which by itself has no defined shape. So an open membrane will look something like this. And yet you'll never see a real membrane like this. And that's because the edge of an open membrane is a very unstable region. And so any membrane system has a strong tendency to close up uh, to form a compartment. And this is of course a crucial feature of membranes because it defines a compartment, which is ultimately what allows life to exist as a discrete entity. Uh, we can in fact divide the whole universe into uh, distinct compartments, which are separated by a bio biological membrane. And there is of course exchange of material between these two compartments, but they never physically mix. And one of them is special and we call it alive. And now, given that all living organisms are surrounded by a liquid membrane, it is very likely that the future synthetic cell will also be built inside a life. But membranes are much more than just passive containers. So one of their most fascinating features is their ability to assume almost any conceivable shape. And this is crucial because shape defines and supports function. And here I bring you an example. Um, the Golgi apparatus is formed by a number of cisterns. And this membrane arrangement facilitates uh, the function of the organelle, which is the stepwise post-translational modification of proteins that transit through the organelle. You can imagine that uh, the membrane shape, like a, like a reticulum, for instance, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, could not fulfill this function efficiently. Now, this EM tomogram exemplifies the rich repertoires of membrane shape that we can find in a cell. Uh, so this is a bug from a yeast cell, and all that you see in this image is membranes. So you see tubes, you see uh, spherical liposomes, you see uh, fenestrated membrane sheets, and of course we see the bud itself, which is also made of membranes. So clearly the cell is able to deform membranes in a very uh, complex way. Uh, and this is something that we're still far from fully understanding, uh, let alone reconstitute. So how can we start to rationalize uh, all these complex membrane shapes. Now, I would argue that there are only three basic membrane shapes. So membranes can be spherical, and this is what we can easily produce in a lab, and we call it liposome. 
uh, if we reduce the dimensionality and we go to a quasi 2D system, then we obtain a membrane sheet. Um, and then if we reduce the dimensionality again, and we go to a quasi 1D system, we obtain what is known as membrane nanotube. And examples of all these three shapes exist uh, in vivo. For instance, we can uh, combine nanotube to obtain uh, what is called a three-way junction. Uh, this is the main structural uh, motive of the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, for instance, in this nice image, you can see the endoplasmic reticulum in orange and a protein called Luna Park in green, which is sitting at the junction and stabilizes them. Now, remarkably, this membrane architecture has been reconstituted in vitro using liposomes and ER resident proteins. Membrane sheets make up some of the most amazing structures that we can find in the cell. Uh, here you can see a different portion of the ER. Uh, so this is a single membrane system uh, where the, the membrane sheets are arranged in a helicoidal fashion. And this is a way for the cell to pack a large amount of membranes in a very confined space. And so in this way, uh, maximize and, and increase the yield and the efficiency of the, of the biosynthetic reaction that happens at the membrane. Now, unfortunately, presently, we don't have a good way to produce membrane sheets in vivo, in vitro, uh, but this is, of course, an exciting future direction for synthetic biology. Now, what about spheres? Um, spheres, we can build complex geometries using spheres as well, and actually, we can do it in two flavors. Uh, spheres can be added, so to speak, and we obtain what is known as a dumbbell or they can be subtracted, let's say, and we obtain uh, this shape, which is known as tomato cell. Now, both geometries have one structural element in common, which is also to me the most interesting one, which is the neck. Uh, this neck has a toroidal or technically it's called catenoid-like shape. Uh, it is a very complex geometry uh, that has both positive and negative membrane curvature, depending on which direction uh, you're looking at. Now, both both of these two shapes can be found in cells. Uh, the stomatocyte, for instance, is the typical shape that we find in the open autophagosome before it is closed by the escort 3 complex. Um, we also find the stomatocytes in some dynamic processes, uh, for instance, during the uh, formation of interluminal vesicles in late endosomes, but will then become uh, multivesicular bodies. And while the, while the overall topology, uh, the overall geometry is different, uh, the neck region in particular uh, recapitulates the membrane geometry that we find at the nuclear envelope, uh, the assembly site of the nuclear core complex, for instance, which also happens to be uh, the, the assembly site of the escort 3 complex when it has to uh, seal um, openings in the nuclear envelope that are caused, for instance, during, during cell migration. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the dumbbell shape is what we often find uh, when a cell is divided. So you can see that being able to generate the shapes in vitro could open uh, many possibilities to study uh, protein complexes that act on these necks, for instance, the nuclear core complex, the S4-3 complex, and many proteins involved in, in cell division, all of which has been uh, so far uh, out of reach. So how do we do this? Uh, well, spherical liposomes can be produced easily in the lab, uh, but how do we generate these shapes starting from spherical liposomes? Uh, first of all, we need to lower the membrane tension uh, because the membrane under, under tension is basically impossible to deform. And that's easy to do. We just raise the, osm the osmotic pressure outside the liposome. This will call deflation and we will increase the surface to volume ratio. And so we will obtain something that looks like this. Now, this is an object that is still very difficult to control because uh, remember, this is still a liquid, so there is no anchor point. Um, it is topologically defined in the sense that we have an inside and an outside, but other than that, it is pretty shapeless. And as you can see, it is very dynamic uh, and often it has a uncontrollable and unpredictable behavior because the shape can be affected by tiny changes in the, in the surrounding environment. I'll bring you an example. Here you see a liposome. This is a single membrane system shaped as a, as a system of dumbbells. And by applying uh, an external stimulus, we can, we can trigger shape transformation into a stomatocyte. Now the question is, how do you 
control an object like this? Um, the answer is actually very simple, and we have known it for a long time, for decades. Uh, we need to introduce membrane curvature in a controlled way. And this has been done in a number of papers. Some of them are listed here, but this is not exhaustive. Uh, and this has, done in has been done in particular for the dumbbell shape, uh, using the same principle that I will introduce in a few minutes. However, uh, one thing is to produce one or few dumbbells, for instance, to study the process of membrane deformation uh, itself. But another thing entirely is to produce them in high yield uh, reproducibly, and also in a way that is compatible with protein reconstitution. And all these previous methodologies have failed to do this, because this is very difficult. Um, and so what we need, we need essentially three things. We need a method to produce liposomes that allows membrane deformation to occur and that preserves then uh, fragile membrane shapes. So we need to avoid things like pipetting. And then we need a tool, and by tool I mean a molecule, uh, that can bind the membrane and generate curvature. And ideally this tool should be uh, stable, should be cheap and, and, and uh, commercially available. And most importantly, both the production method and the tool should be compatible with protein reconstitution. And this means that none of them can have uh, uh, very strict requirements in terms of buffer composition and membrane composition, because these requirements are often set by the protein that we want to reconstitute on top of these membrane platforms. So for the first point, uh, the technique that I'm using to produce vesicles is based on C dyes. Uh, C dyes stands for continuous droplet interface encapsulation, and it is a method to produce liposomes that has been around for about 10 years. Uh, in a joint effort between the Ganziger lab in Amulf and the Konderik, Decker, and Danero lab at the TU Delft, uh, we optimized the C dyes protocol uh, with an improved uh, lipid preparation method that was initially uh, developed by Christina Ganziger. Now, C dyes is a technique that is already uh, playing a major role in synthetic biology, and I'm sure it has a bright future, in particular when it comes to uh, building a synthetic cell. Uh, in a nutshell, how it works, uh, we have a, a chamber, which is a rotating chamber, which is filled with an outer water solution and also, uh, and then with a liquid oil suspension. Uh, there's a capillary that continuously releases droplets, uh, and this droplet will then become the inner solution of the liposome. And these droplets, uh, when they are in the lipid in oil suspension, they acquire the first monolayer of lipid. And then when they cross the oil water interface, they acquire the second monolayer and they end up as liposomes in the water phase where we retrieve them. Now it's important to know that the progression of the droplets from the oil phase to the water phase is driven by the centrifugal force of the rotating chamber. But then this becomes a problem when we want to preserve fragile membrane shapes. So in order to preserve the shapes, I introduced some changes in this basic C dyes technique, and I call this variant gentle emulsion droplets interface encapsulation, or GE dyes. And in GE dyes, uh, the droplets are deposited in a chamber uh, which is not rotated, it's just a chamber. And so they simply sink by gravity, and eventually they will cross the interface and become liposomes. So this is similar, if you want, to the old-fashioned way to make liposomes by inverted emulsion. But here I use uh, the C dyes lipid preparation method, and also some reagents that were specifically uh, developed for C dyes. So I still consider this to be uh, a C dyes variation. What's important in this is that this makes the process of liposome formation slow and gentle. There's no pipetting needed, and so uh, this allows the membrane to deform, uh, and then it also preserves these fragile membrane structures. Now, for the second point, the tool that we're using to induce membrane curvature. Um, this tool is what we call synthetic membrane shaper, or SMS in short. Uh, the SMS is the collective name that we give to uh, the ensemble of many uh, cross shaped DNA nanostructures uh, called nanostars. Uh, these nanostars are about 100 kilodalton uh, in size, and they are functionalized with two cholesterol oligos uh, each uh, that are indicated here by a red triangle. And so in the presence of a membrane, uh, these nanostars, which are soluble, uh, uh, they insert very efficiently in the, in the membrane, and so they anchor the nanostars. And here I can show a snapshot from an all-atom simulation, which is done by our collaborator, Bart Tunings, from the, from the Marlin Club. And here you can see the cholesterol in red that is inserted into the bilayer and is dragging the DNA with it. And the way this works is actually very simple. 
uh, when the cholesterol is inserted asymmetrically, means only one side of the membrane, the expanded area of one layer. Nicola, Nicola, can I interrupt? Yes. I mean, while the sound so far was fantastic, it now in the last tens of seconds started to waver a bit. In, in volume, it goes up and down a little. So I don't know if you've changed anything in the sound. Okay, setting. I try to stay closer to the microphone like this. Give it a try. Just go okay. ahead. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, as I said, the presence of the nanostars only on one side of the membrane will cause bending of the membrane towards that side. Uh, this means that uh, if we reconstitute the SMS inside a liposome, then the membrane will bend inward and it will result in the formation of a stomatocyte. And here you can see the process rendered by large scale membrane simulation uh, done by our collaborator, Varia Pazeshkin, now at the University of Copenhagen. Now, in this image, you can see a single confocal plane of a stomatocyte that is obtained by using the SMS. Now, if you produce liposome in the way that I described earlier, uh, you will obtain a certain amount of stomatocytes, but the presence of the SMS dramatically increases the yield and also makes these structures more stable. And you can see this in this, in this quantification here. Now, a true stomatocyte must have an open toroidal pore that connects the inner compartment with the exterior. And so we want to prove that, that such a pore exists in our, in our stomatocytes. And we did it by the following experiment. We created uh, stomatocytes in the presence of a soluble dye, which obviously end up both, both outside the stomatocyte and also in the inner lumen. And then we bleach the inner compartment and we wait for the recovery. And as you can see, over time, uh, the dye recovers. And this can only happen if there's a, a toroidal pore present. Now, conversely, if we bind the SMS outside the liposome, then the membrane will bend outward, and this will result in the production of dumbbells. And here you can see again the same process uh, rendered by uh, large scale membrane simulation by Varia. Um, please notice that the same process can, can actually often does result in a chain of dumbbells rather than in, in a simple dumbbell. Now, imaging a complex membrane shape like this is tricky, can be tricky, and one needs to be aware of potential artifacts. For instance, uh, this dumbbell here, uh, well, we don't really know if it's a dumbbell or not, because it could just be uh, two liposomes adhering to each other. To make sure that it's a dumbbell, what we do, we bleach the fluorescent lipids on one, on one lobe, and then we measure the recovery. And if there is recovery, as in this case, then we can be sure that this is a true dumbbell. And uh, now, thanks to the high yield uh, of dumbbells that we obtain with the SMS, this experiment can be performed, can be performed on dozens of, of dumbbells. What we can do is also to encapsulate very easily fluorescent dye uh, in the lumen of these dumbbells. And then we can do the same kind of experiment. We bleach the dye and we wait for the recovery. Then this case must come from the other lobe. And so in this way, we are sure there is an open neck between the two lobes. And actually, based on this recovery curve, uh, Alessio was able to uh, develop a mathematical model, and he could estimate the size of this, of this toroidal pore, which in this particular case happens to be 23 uh, nanometers. So this is a rather tight length. So as I said, the point of developing the SMS uh, is to be able to use it as a membrane platform for synthetic biology. This means that we must be able to encapsulate macromolecules like uh, nucleic acid and, and proteins easily in order to study their properties. And here I bring you an example of that. On the left, you can see a real bacterium uh, uh, with the membrane in, in yellow and then the bacterial DNA uh, in red. And on the right, you can see a chain of dumbbells obtained with the, with the SMS um, where we have encapsulated uh, large DNA molecules, uh, lambda DNA. Um, so it turns out that with SMS, it's actually pretty easy to encapsulate DNA. And you can also notice that the presence of the DNA does not preclude membrane deformation. And actually, uh, the DNA becomes segregated in the lobe by the action of the SMS. And this is something that may be of interest uh, if you think of developing a segregation system for the genome of a, of a synthetic cell. 
but encapsulating DNA is actually a rather easy task because the lambda DNA is, does not really interact with the membrane. Uh, it is much harder, harder to reconstitute proteins that bind the membrane because these proteins are going to affect the very process of liposome formation and also the process of membrane deformation. However, with the SMS, this is possible. And this is what we're going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. <clears throat> in this movie, you see a dividing bacterium. And this bright green ring in the middle is called Z-ring. Uh, the Z-ring is a structure that spans the membrane and connects and, and coordinates uh, the peptidoglycan machinery on the outside with the constriction ring on the inside. And it is composed of hundreds of proteins, but the main structural component is this protein called FTSZ. Uh, using the SMS, it is rather easy to reconstitute FTZ at the neck of the dumbbell. Uh, and as you, as you can see in these images, I also have a movie here. So here we're using the protein zip A, which is also part of the Z link, uh, as an anchor to link uh, FTZ to the membrane. So what we noticed is that FTZ induces the formation of very long necks. Uh, indicating that uh, it might be actively generating a negative curvature. Uh, when Varia did the membrane simulation adding proteins, he could observe the same thing. Um, now, please notice now that uh, the protein and the SMS are bound to opposite sides of the membrane, so uh, as it is shown in the schematics, so they, they, don't, they don't influence each other. Uh, reconstitution of FTSE in dumbbells has been done before, for instance, by the Danero lab or by the Schwill lab. So for us, this was simply uh, a nice way to confirm that the SMS was working as, as it is supposed to. Uh, we could also reconstitute FTSE in stomatocytes using the SMS. Uh, and here too, we observe elongated necks, uh, both in experiments and also in simulation, uh, again done by, <coughs> by Varia. In this case, the necks are protruding inside the liposome because the protein is outside and the SMS is inside. And this is also shown in the schematic uh, on the top. Okay, so now we want to use the SMS to do uh, something new. And the protein we are working on is Dynamin A. Uh, Dynamin A is a member of the uh, Dynamin superfamily, a uh, bacterial member of the Dynamin superfamily. Uh, it was shown to localize to the Z ring of bacteria uh, when they divide. And it was also shown that when this protein is deleted, um, this, this leads to a, to a very a less efficient division and often there are abortive events, what you can see here at the bottom. And this finding together with its similarity with the eukaryotic dynamic that mediates membrane scission during uh, endocytosis, for instance, this led to the speculation that dynamic A could be a protein that mediates the last uh, membrane abscission event in during, during uh, cell division in bacteria. So our working hypothesis is that dynamin A could be a minimal membrane scission machine. When we reconstitute the dynamin A using the SMS, we find that it localizes to the neck of stomatocytes. And this is what you can see in these images. Here I also have a movie showing this bright green dynamin uh, spot that is stably localized at the neck of this nice stomatocyte. Um, similarly, there is a strong enrichment of uh, dynamic A at the neck of thumbs. So this data indicates that dynamic A can sense membrane curvature, and it doesn't need to be, to need to, it doesn't need an adapter to localize at the neck. In fact, it could behave as an adapter. Also, we don't observe long necks, and this means that uh, dynamin A is not able to actively generate negative curvature, at least in our experimental conditions. We often also observe uh, chains of dumbbells with uh, dynamin spots nicely localized at the neck. To conclude, uh, we have developed the SMS as a novel tool to control membrane shape. Uh, this tool can be used to reconstitute and study uh, challenging proteins uh, um, that assemble on double membrane pores, such as the nuclear core complex or the SCOR3 complex. Um, what's important is that the SMS provides a membrane platform that is not rigid 
it can be remodeled by proteins. And so uh, this is also a tool to study the activity, the membrane modeling activity of proteins. And importantly also, SMS does not, does not require any specialized equipment, so it can be easily performed by anyone just with a bit of training. Okay, with this, I thank you for your attention, and I would like to thank all the people involved in this work. Uh, first of all, my supervisor, Case Decker, for his support, and also for his constant drive in pursuing always the most difficult and rewarding results. And then other people from the lab involved in the project, in particular, Alessio, for the modeling of the core. Uh, but I hope that during this uh, presentation, I've convinced you that to shape a membrane, one can act on both sides. And so equally important for this project were uh, the external collaborations with membrane experts. And so I would like to thank warmly Christina, Heise, and their PhD students uh, for a very fruitful collaboration. And then also great thanks goes to our collaborators on the membrane modeling side. So Sperjan, Veria, and Bart, and also to Patricia Bassero for, for useful discussion. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was a nice presentation, I thought, at least. So, uh, that if you need UV, won't that induce mutagenesis of the synthetic cell genome? Yes, uh, that's a good question. The, the answer is potentially yes. Um, so what we're doing now is using UV as a trigger to activate dynamine, uh, uh, controlling the timing of activation so that we can be sure that dynamine is actually uh, inducing membrane transition. However, we don't need to use UV to have an active dynamine. All you need is just to have magnesium. So I can imagine that if we build this synthetic cell, I can imagine we're gonna have some kind of pure system encapsulated inside the liposome. And then at the right time, when we are in the, in the, in the dumbbell shape, dynamine A will be, will be expressed and it will go at the neck. And since there is magnesium, it's gonna perform its function and we don't need UV for that. Yeah, yeah. So the answer to your question there was it's just a technical trick for now. And in the final use synthetic cell, we need to use different schemes there. There's a question from Emma Jones here. Uh, what kind of membrane compositions can work in your system? What are the constraints on other membrane proteins? Nicola. Um, so this is one of the nice things about the, the SMS. Uh, there isn't really um, any constraint in terms of membrane composition, at least as far as we have tried. So we have tried, so the membrane is mostly made of UPC, but then we have added like uh, DGS lipids, so lipids with, with a NTA tag to, to recruit proteins by the his tag, and that works. We've used negatively charged lipids up to 10%, and that works. And this is probably the most important uh, aspect because most mem membrane binding proteins require negatively charged lipids. So, yeah, I wouldn't say there's uh, any limitation in that sense. Yeah. And the other second part was uh, how about other membrane proteins? Is there a constraint on other membrane proteins? Uh, it's not clear if you mean transmembrane proteins or membrane binding protein. In terms of it's membrane. It's not clear, but let's say transmembrane proteins transmembrane to make proteins, the most dramatic case. Yeah. So we haven't tried yet to reconstitute transmembrane proteins, but uh, that's, I think, one of the most interesting things to try. So I'm going to do that for sure. Uh, I'm expecting that it should be possible to reconstitute transmembrane proteins because we have already reconstituted large uh, DNA origami rings using, using the seed dyes, and this is a very related technique. So I'm expect expecting that this should be possible in principle. Yes. Another question uh, from Petra Ahmed. Oh, sorry, Pearl Ahmed, sorry for that. Uh, fascinating talk. Is there an osmotic pressure difference between inside and outside? And would that affect the shape changes uh, if the synthetic cytoplasm is high osmolarity versus the outside solution? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. Um, in vitro, we need to have uh, an os a higher osmotic pressure outside in order to make the membrane deformable. Uh, which is not the case in vivo, for instance, for bacteria. Uh, I guess that we, we will need to match the outside solution with the cytoplasm of the synthetic cells, at least at the beginning, to be able to divide it. And then maybe we can move to more sophisticated systems that can also work against 
uh, yeah. osmotic pressure. Yeah, but to be clear, your technique, our technique uses this osmotic pressure difference currently. Yeah. Yes, yes, all techniques do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another like question from Ivan Amberley. And, and please, by the way, please feel for, uh, free to follow up on questions. Uh, if the answer is not clear or evokes new questions, please speak up in the chat. Uh, other question by Ivan Amberley. Uh, what percentage of, of total liposome population undergoes this size changes? Yes, this is a very important point because we want it to be efficient. Uh, so in, I can answer in the case of the stomatocytes, uh, in the ideal conditions, a large percentage, like 70, 80 uh, percent, can undergo this, undergo this size, this uh, conformational change. Uh, in the case of dumbbells, this is much more difficult to quantify. I haven't really quantified because uh, it's hard to tell where a dumbbell ends and where another begins when the sample is particularly crowded. Uh, however, this is in, in uh, ideal conditions. Then, of course, when you start adding protein, changing the buffer, and so on, this this yield uh, goes down a bit. Um, what, I, what, what I can say is that I never have any problem in finding these objects. So there's always at least few few stomatocytes or few dumbbells for each field of view. So it is very easy to perform experiments on them. So very high yields. I mean, this was not asked, but I can add to this. This is a bit size dependent, right? Because you find this for lower micron size uh, liposomes, but for much larger liposomes, you don't find such high yields, right? Yeah, and this is puzzling and fascinating. Why, why do large vesicles not feel this effect, effect of the osmotic pressure? We don't know. We don't really know. And if anybody has an idea, I'd be happy to hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. James Pelletier has a question. Hi, James. Nice to see you here. Uh, long time no see. He, and James was asking, or actually first making a statement, beautiful talk, and then he had a question. Yeah. Why does the SMS have an X shape with two cholesterol groups? Nicola, uh, your nanostars. Why do we have this funny yeah, shape? Uh, it wasn't really designed uh, very specifically. We wanted to aim for. We wanted to see for, for historical reason. We wanted to have a, a DNA construct with a small uh, size, and this was the easiest way to have it. And we wanted to be functional, to functionalize it, so it was. Uh, convenient to have four arms that can each one be functionalized and we went for two collateral groups because because it works i guess that's the best answer <laughs> it's a frozen accident in the in the evolution of uh, of our project <laughs> that that way, yes. yeah. <laughs> another question from karen bertel uh what range of protein concentration do you need to induce these shape changes I imagine not enough protein won't induce change, and too much protein will not create nice dumbbell. What's the range? The range is in the about 100 nanomolar. Uh, that's the, the range, especially when you have the protein in the inside, when you have dumbbells. If you have the protein outside, you need to raise the concentration a bit. Um, yeah, but you're right. So this this is asking how about too, too little concentration to, to high concentration? Uh, to little concentration, it will actually still work. You will just see less of them having something localized on the neck. Uh, if you have too much protein, that's going to uh, stop the system from working because the protein is basically going to um, bind uh, too strongly. It was going to deform the protein and it doesn't really let the process happen. This is what happens. So is it is it pretty robust or is it super critical to tune the concentration just right? Uh, this particular um, parameter is actually rather critical, but of course this depends on your protein. Uh, you can go 200 nanomolar to between 50 and 200. You can. Mm, okay. All right. Yep. Thanks. Very detailed. Uh, good answer. Another question by Anna Theresa Dario. Uh, sorry if I missed it in the talk. Do you add more lipids or is the division without growth so daughter vesicles end up smaller than the parent population? Um, yeah, so uh, the, the second, so uh, we start from, uh, from a liposome with a certain size and then we divide it so that the, the daughter size will be smaller. However, um, uh, you can use the same kind of cholesterol oligos also to drive membrane fusion. And this is being done uh, by Isaac Connery, for instance, and uh, that. So in principle, we could combine the two. We could combine deformation and also vesicle fusion in order to achieve both 
membrane growth and division, and so to keep the size of the of the synthetic cell uh, constant in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope that answers your question, Anna Theresa. Uh, another question by Vivian Emmanuel. Very impressive work. Thank you for the presentation. What program did you use for those gorgeous membrane dynamic animations? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's done with Blender. Uh, so you can you can do pretty, quite a lot of things with Blender. If uh, it's a free software, has plenty of tutorial uh, online. So if you're interested, I can give you some some tips how to use it. All right. These were the questions from the chat so far. Quite a long list of detailed questions already, and quick questions and answers here. Are there any other questions anybody wants to like I'd like to ask? You cannot unmute apparently because the format here, but you can ask questions in the chat and you're much welcome to do so. I have a question that yes, I would Kate, like to ask in my unmute. mouth. Very good, go ahead. <laughs> Anyone can unmute themselves, but people Oh, they can, okay, I thought, I thought you said they could or they shouldn't or something. Yeah, no, Sorry. they never, for some reason, participants never unmute that they All right, but here you can. are, ask your question. Um, about the yield of, large vesicles versus small vesicles um it's it might be a little bit of a naive question but is it possible that whatever protein structure you need to induce a shape change is not stable as it gets bigger so then you cannot induce shape changes on the really large vesicles and then with a small vesicle you get away with a smaller structure does that even make sense uh, i think you're right and the um, uh... Quantitatively, I think this is what is happening. So we have a certain, we have molecules that induce curvature that are, are of a certain size. And I guess when the difference between the size of the molecule and the size of the vesicle, which is of course much bigger, when that difference becomes too large, then they're not able to act anymore. So they, there's a certain range where they can exert their, their curvature, uh, the activity on membrane curvature. So yes, I think this is probably the, the explanation. It may be that with larger DNA structure, we can achieve uh, the same kind of deformation on larger vesicles but we haven't tried that okay there's a follow-up question by peter bandel on your answer about this fusion idea right so our lab is also has basically done some stuff where we fuse very small unilimited and unilimited vesicles to these large giants uh, unilimited vesicles the question is can you talk a little bit further about it explain it a bit more and it, it, he and Peter Bandel is saying this would be really interesting if you can combine the fusion with the divisions. Nicola. Yeah, no, I agree. It would be it would be fantastic. I cannot really say more about that because it's not my project. So I, I know they are doing it. Uh, and I know this is based on previous work. So this has yeah. been going on for, for many years. I can say, I can add actually that in our own lab, we see that they spawned a, a couple of years ago. We showed that you can take a, a giant ulimine fresco and then you add small unit small i mean say 100 nanometer 50 nanometer uh, tiny liposomes and just by playing with the tension of that you can fuse those and dump the content of the suvs into the giant ulimine fresco this was published you can check it out um, and so in that way we could grow the total liposome size by well, a factor of two or something like that so you could think of stages in this in the life of a synthetic cell where you have a stage of growth and of course all kind of internal processes happening as well but this could be growth by this externally delivered suvs and then a stage where you do uh, say a liposome division in the way nicola presented for example so and then of course you have to coordinate all that but yeah so there's some challenges ahead but you can in principle foresee a certain sort of life cycle of synthetic cell. Yeah. Peter, is that answering your question? Or, uh, please feel free to unmute. Uh, apparently you can unmute. So if, if you have a further follow-up, please unmute and speak up. All right, I don't hear anything. So maybe move to the next question from Brendan Mortich. Is there any way to couple the division protein structure with some type of cell cytoskeleton structures? That's a very good question. Uh, my naive answer would be yes, because by, by creating, say, uh, a dumbbell, for instance, we have created a certain asymmetry. And so I can imagine that 
if inside that dumbbell we can then trigger uh, know, microtubule elongation, they will arrange in a certain way and, and hopefully along the axis. So I would say this is in principle possible. Uh, we haven't tried. Yeah, I guess it also depends on your definition of cytoskeleton yeah. structures. I mean, in a sense, yeah. FTSV is a cytoskeleton-like uh, structure as well. But uh, I think he's was in need, alluding to what you just answered, like microtubule-like structures and all that. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone? Very general questions about the whole approach or specific details? Anyone? Seems not. Then we stop at this point. Kate, do you want to say a few word, more words? I think this was the first, in, again, in a long series of talks or something. Can you say a few words about that? Um, yes, that? this was the first talk in a series. I think we have six or eight planned right now um, from the basic consortium. I don't know who's going to be hosting the next ones. Probably you, Cass, if you're there. Okay. And I just want to say thank you, Nicola, very much for this talk. This was fascinating and really a lot to think about and a lot to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And for those who don't know, this is indeed uh, we're in Delft and part of this basic consortium, which is a, yeah, a building a cell consortium in the Netherlands. It involves mm, some 15 groups, one, five groups working on very different aspects, metabolism or gene, genetic control and liposome formation and all that. My own group is more focused on the liposome formation and cell division aspects, but also some genome spatial structure stuff. If you have any interest, uh, please feel free to contact us, of course. All right, I think that concludes it. Thanks a lot, Kate, for hospitality. Thanks everyone to, uh, for participating. See you next time, all right? Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye.